When the storm continues raging, Acts 27, 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for how many days? And the storm continued what? We finally gave up all hope of being saved. This was not the sermon I had planned on preaching, but sometimes God has other plans. And what's really amazing is that song that Jonathan, we, there was no communication between us on that song. So God will have his will be done no matter what. And so today we're going to go straight from the drought into a storm. Have you ever been in a storm that seems to never end? I, I'm sure it has felt like that for these people who, who live in Houston. The ones that have been devastated by this terrible hurricane. I, I'm sure it seemed like the, the rains would never stop. And, and we, didn't, we didn't go through what they've gone through. But boy, here it seems like the rain has never stopped. Such terrible devastation and such terrible loss there in Houston. And you know what, maybe you're not going through a physical hurricane, but maybe you're going through a spiritual one. Maybe you're not going through a physical hurricane, but you're going through an emotional roller coaster, and, and, and it seems like it's never going to end. You see, some storms seem to last forever, uh, forever, one thing after another, and it can be easy to do what these guys are doing when you finally give up hope of being saved. That's what's happening here in Acts. People have lost hope, but then God shows up to Paul in a mighty way. God reveals himself to Paul in a mighty way in the storm. You know, as I was studying this story, I kept thinking, and thank goodness Paul was on board. Amen? Thank God Paul was on board. You know what? I want people to think the same thing about us. Thank goodness that Kurt is an elder. Sometimes. <laughs> Thank goodness that that person's in the church. Thank goodness that person's on the job. You know, I want my children to think, thank goodness he's my dad. I want my wife to think, thank goodness I married such a hunk of a man. <laughs> no, I want my wife, thank goodness I married him, not what did I do. Friends, the recovery in Houston should be better because the church is in Houston where Christians are. Thank goodness Paul was on board. Do people say that about you? Acts 27, 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you have, should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself what? Damage and loss. Now Paul is human, so he's got to throw in some I told you so. Sometimes you got to say I told you so. Because you want to make, why do you say I told you so? Because you want to make sure that, that, that it has made the connection in their brain that because you did this, now you are getting this. Because we don't want people to repeat the same mistake, amen? You see, this is why I told you not to marry him. This is why I told you not to be sexually intimate before married. You see, this is why I told you, don't even take a sip. This is why I said, don't loan people money. You loan people's money, don't expect for it back. I told you so. You see, Paul has faith, but he's still frustrated because he says in this statement, he says, look, God is going to deliver us. That's his faith. But, but, but he's also frustrated. It did not have to happen this way. You see, faith does not exempt you from frustration. 
In fact, very often our faith guarantees frustration. You should have taken my advice, then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. You know how much damage and loss, friends, we would spare ourselves if we would just listen to what God said. If we just listen and do what God says. Yes, I can save you divorced, broke, and under a bridge with nothing, but I also could have saved you married at home with a little something. It's just not until you reach the end of your rope that you finally took out the whole, hold the hand of God. And so Paul throws out a little, I told you so, but then he, he moves on. You see, see, yeah, maybe, maybe you say a little, I told you so, but don't stay in the, I told you so. Why? Because it's irrelevant. What has been done has been done. Don't stay in that storm. You need to go on and get out of the problem, and you need to move into the solution. And so he says, yeah, you, you would have been spared this problem, but now I urge you to keep up your what? Oh, yeah, man, I love positive people, amen? I love people who are positive. I, I, like, to, I like to be positive. I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship's going to be destroyed because, you see, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I serve, stood beside me, and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. You see, you're not going down in this battle because I've got bigger battles, Paul, for you to face. God has gracious, graciously given you the things of all who sail, given you the lives of all who sail with you. You see, thank goodness Paul was on board. God blessed the ship because Paul was there. And so he says, so keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Friends, do you believe that God's blessings will happen just as God told you? Do you believe, do you trust that what God says he means? You see, this is what faith looks like, folks. If God said he was going to take care of you, you need to have faith that in God that it will happen just as he told you. If God said he was going to resurrect me, I have faith that, that in God it will happen just as he told me. If God said there will be no more death, or no more pain, no more sorrow, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. If God said, behold, I come quickly, I have faith that God's going to do it exactly how he told me. If God said it, hallelujah, we can believe it. We can believe it. And so Paul is captive on a boat for preaching the gospel. I want you to think about that. He's being punished for not doing the wrong thing. He's being punished for doing the right thing. He's in trouble because he's doing what God asked him to do. <laughs> you know, I read an article this week where people are already trying to use disaster for their agenda. I can't stand it when the news media does that. Big article about this is because of global warming that this hurricane happened. Meanwhile, people are hurting and they're suffering. Man, it's hurricane season. Hurricanes happen in hurricane season. And I know it was a terrible storm, and I'm not minimalizing that, but, 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 but it's hurricane season, and, and when Katrina hit, I heard Christians say some pretty dumb things too. God's punishing New Orleans because they're such a sinful city. Well, if that was the case, God would have sent a flood to your house a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, I explain to me then Houston. Is it because Houston is such a sinful city that God is, is somehow smiting them? No, storms happen in a broken world. And just like with Paul, they happen not just when you do the wrong thing, they can happen when you do the right thing. Our problem is we always try to find a reason, a reason for the pain. That's our greatest problem. We try, to, we try to look for a reason. When people die, we try to console them by giving them a reason. Will God let them die because of... The, don't do that. 
Don't do that. People don't need a reason when they're in a storm. They just need to be reassured that God is with them. They don't need a reason their spouse left them. They don't need a reason that their child died. They don't need a reason they got cancer. Once they got the cancer, they don't need a reason. They just need reassurance, friends, that, 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 that I, I, I keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Instead of giving them a reason, give them that. Because the reality is in this sin-sick world, not everything happens for a reason. Sometimes it just happens. I mean, Paul is in the storm because of someone else's dumb decision. Have you ever been in a storm because of someone else's dumb decision? Yes, you have. But check it out. God can even use other people's dumb decisions in order to get you to your destination. See, even though God didn't cause it, he can take what happens to you that is painful and that, that, that is a result of sin, and he can use, still use it in order to get you into glory. He can use other people's dumb decisions in order to get you to your destination. Remember when Joseph looks out at his brothers after these rascals uh, betrayed him, sold him into slavery, left him for dead. Remember what he said? He says, as you, you meant, you, you meant it for what? evil but God meant it for what which is it is it evil that they did or is it good the answer is it's both it's both it was evil what the brothers did God did not cause the brothers to do that but God took the evil of what they planted and did both. Friends, it, it, it didn't have to happen. As Paul says, it didn't have to be this way. God didn't do this. God didn't do what Hurricane Harvey has done, but yet he can still use it in order to accomplish what is now being done and the saving of many lives. So stop looking for a reason. Christians, don't look for a reason of why this happened, because if you keep looking for a reason, you are going to miss the revelation. If you look for the reason, you miss the revelation. You see, God did not give John a, a, a reason on the island of Patmos. What did he give him? He gave him something better. He gave him a revelation. That's why it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. God didn't give Joshua a reason just before Israel attacked Jericho and, and had to march around the walls and do all these things and, and, and fight all these things. He didn't give him a reason. He, he gave him a revelation. God did not give Daniel a reason when he cried out to him in chapter 9. Why am I still in Babylon and when are you going to let us go back to Jerusalem? Instead, God gives him a revelation. You don't need a reason the storm is happening in your life. You just need to know that God is by your side. And you know what I've discovered? You can't fight the devil with a reason. You can't fight the devil just with logic alone. You can't fight your feelings uh, with reason alone because you know that you can know something cerebrally, you can know something logically and still not believe it in your heart. Reasons do not change Christians. Revelations of God do. And that's why in this storm, God gives Paul a revelation, not a reason. This is why, Je you know, this is why Jesus let Lazarus die. To give people a revelation of himself. Up to this point, they just saw Jesus as a, he a healer, a little miracle worker. But Jesus is like, no. You got to see, uh, you got to, I got to reveal to you that I am the resurrection and I am the life. This is why he lets this storm happen to this ship. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Because before you will see me as your only deliverer, I have to deliver you. I don't need a reason when I have a revelation of God. I don't need a reason why is this happening to me, Lord. When I cling to the revelation, when hard times and the storm is raging, don't ask God for a reason. You just ask Him for a revelation. You see, this is why parents don't give a reason to tell their kids to do something. You do it because I said so. And, and if you don't 
do it, I'm going to give you a revelation of who I am in the, re in the relationship. I am judge and I am executor. I am judge and I am jury. There's going to be some wailing and gnashing of teeth. Don't ask for a reason. Stop asking for a reason. You don't need the reason. Ask God for a revelation. And that's what God gave Paul. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve did what? You need to know that in your storms, God stands beside you. That's his revelation. The people make it. The boat does not. They lost their stuff. But check it out. Not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. See, God doesn't really care about the stuff. He cares about you. So the marriage might have tanked. You might have lost your job. And, and maybe you've lost your home. They foreclosed on it. Maybe the depression has just about destroyed you. But nothing can touch God's purpose for your life. The ship went down, but Paul still made it. He's going to still fulfill his mission. Nothing can touch the calling God has given to you. And so in verse 1 of chapter 28, after we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called what? Malta. Interestingly, the name Malta means refuge. You see, God doesn't prevent bad things from happening, but he gives you a refuge in the bad things. Your ship may have run aground. You might have sustained some losses in your life, but, but God will provide for you a refuge. Church, people wrecked from the storms of life should find refuge in the church. I should have heard way more amens. <clears throat> Let me break it down for you this way. We shouldn't have to worry about the stuff in the storm out in the world coming in the church and hitting us here. This place should be a refuge from the negativity. This place should be a refuge from the hate. This place should be a refuge from the gossip. This should be the, uh, 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 a refuge from the cynicism and the sarcasm. This should be a place where we come in and say, Hallelujah, God loves you, God loves me, and we can grow in faith. This church is to be a refuge. And the Bible says that this island, the native people showed us unusual, check this out, unusual what? The church should be a place of unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and they welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was what? What Paul says about these natives, People should say about College Drive. They build a fire to warm the ship, shipwrecked. The church should be the warmest place on the planet. And Paul is on the island because of a shipwreck. Think about it. He's in a place he had not planned for. Have you ever been in a place you did not plan on being at? When you said in sickness and health and in good times and bad times, I do, you did not expect years later to be sitting at a desk signing divorce papers. You never thought those little perfect angels that, 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 you, that, that you called your kids would, would grow up and have so many troubles. You never, you're, you're at a place you never expected to be. You didn't plan on raising kids when you were 40. When little Taylor came along, we had sold all that stuff. But I arrived at a place I had not expected to be. Back at Babies R Us, buying a high chair again. Buying another stroller. Whole time I'm thinking, I, I had this stuff. You never thought that, that you'd be turned 30 and you'd still be single. You never thought you'd struggle in your Christian walk would be so real. You see, Malta is a lonely, cold, unexpected place. We have all been to an island called Malta. And that's why this place, we need to kindle a fire of the Holy Spirit. And we need to have such a warmth here. 
Paul is trying to make himself, the story continues, Paul tries to start making himself useful. Christians, we, we, we want to make ourselves useful, amen? Let's say it, Lord, make me useful. Hallelujah, praise, praise the Lord. So Paul's making himself useful. He sees something he got to pick up, sees some trash on the floor, you pick it up. He, he sees they're building a fire, he picks up some sticks, and he starts helping them with a the fire. That's what we do as Christians. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, put them on the fire, <clears throat> a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. Quick review. Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. He's shipwrecked because people didn't want to listen to him. He's cold and he's marooned on an unexpected island and now a snake bites him. Has, have you ever had a day like this? Amen. You know, just when Paul thinks the storm is over, the shipwreck is over, hallelujah, kissing the ground, and then a snake bites him. Has that ever happened to you? And maybe it wasn't a literal snake, but the venomous attack of a church member. Maybe it was the venom of someone you work with. It, it was the venom of a spouse who in anger spit that poison at you. David talks about it in the Psalms. It says they make their tongue sharp as what? It's talking about people. And, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Have you ever been bit by an asp? Pff, pff, asp. <laughs> Check it out. This snake, have you caught that? Have you didn't? Look at this. This snake didn't just strike him. Check it out. The Bible says it fastened onto him. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, I mean, can you see that? He's just kind of working, hang, viper hanging. They said to one another, notice, this is people, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Isn't that just how we are? He got fired? Oh my goodness, it must have been because of this, 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 and this. They got a divorce? Oh, I bet you he did this, this, and this. They think God is punishing Paul. But check this out. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. Paul preaches one of the most powerful sermons ever preached without even opening his mouth. And so now they wait for him. They keep watching him. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had, they knew about this snake. They were waiting for them to fall over dead. But when they had waited a long time, saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Friends, when the storms are going to, the, the, when they rage and, and sometimes you're going to get wrecked and sometimes you're going to be marooned on islands like Malta, it's going to happen. But you need to know that what matters most for Christians in those situations is how you respond to those situations. How do you treat people when they hurt you? Is it revenge time? How do you respond when people mistreat you? Do you say, oh, I'm going to get them. I'm coming after them with a vengeance. And you'll notice Paul didn't get on his pity pot. Pity pot. He didn't get on Facebook and write about it. <laughs> that, that was a hint right there. <laughs> Don't air out your dirty laundry on Facebook, please. By the grace of God, we don't need to know of that. He doesn't throw up his hands and say, you know what? I'm out of this church. I'm sick of these snakes biting me. I'm sick of these people mistreating me. No, the Bible says he did what? Shook it off. I get it. That person hurts you. Now shake it off. I get it, you were mistreated. Shake it off. Someone disappointed you. I bet you've disappointed some people in your life. Shake that stuff off. <sighs> College Drive, we knew that when we planted a church that some of the people who used to worship here were going to worship there. You should not be surprised.
God's grown this church and blessed this church over the past five years. We've watched the growth trends. God has consistently blessed this church. Why do you, th you, do you not think he can do it again? We still are averaging more people in the church with the ridge. We could plant another ridge and still averaging more than we were averaging five years ago. Don't focus on the negative. Focus on the positive. You just, you just did what God called you to do. You advanced the kingdom of God. You reversed what this world says church is to come into a building and sit down and listen to a sermon. No, it's about going into every nation, kindred, tongue, community with the gospel. Shake that nonsense off. But sometimes, like Paul's viper, man, those things really latch on to us. Those snakes. They latch on. Notice it didn't say it just bit him. It latches on to him. Well, when they latch on to you, you need to keep on shaking. If it's affecting your worship, you need to keep on shaking. If it's hurting your relationship, you need to keep on shaking. If you're losing sleep over it, you got to keep on shaking. Go on and shake off the resentment and shake off that sin. Shake off the condemnation. Do not leave this church today with a serpent hanging from your heart. Think about it. Paul didn't keep the snake as a pet. But some of us here are holding on to resentments we've had for 20 years. Like they are a pet. In fact, it's no longer latched on to us. We've latched on to the snake. But this is the problem. It's poisonous and it's killing you. you got to let that stuff go. And check this off. And we're, we're finishing now. Check this out. When, Paul, when, when, when they saw Paul shake it off, they believed. And when you finally forgive and you forget and you love people unconditionally and you reach. And that doesn't mean you, you put a stamp of approval on their sin. It just means you love them. And, and, and you recognize you're a sinner and they are a sinner. But when you start doing that, people are going to say, man, there is a God up in heaven. People are watching you in your storm. Just as these natives were watching Paul in his storm, your children are watching you and your spouse is watching you. Are you living a life worth watching? The Bible says they change their minds. You see, the way you respond to your storm can change someone's mind about God. Someone might have thought God was a God of hate, but then they met you and they, you changed their mind. No, God is a God of love. Someone may have been ready to give up on their marriage, but then they met you and, and you barely made it at a point in your marriage and you've changed their mind. The Bible says they changed their minds. Another lesson from that statement there is, uh, this is also why you can't completely rely and trust on people. Think about it. They thought he was a murderer one second. Next second, he's a god. They cried, out, they cried out hosannas at the beginning of the week and they shouted out crucify him at the end of the week. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius who received us and entertained us hospitably for how many days? Paul's, think of it, Paul's adversity has given him an opportunity to witness. I hope you know your adversities are giving you opportunities to witness that you wouldn't otherwise have. When tragedy happens, what an opportunity. When, when Hurricane Harvey's happen, what an opportunity for Christians to real, reveal God to the world. It happened that Father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul, check this out, Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hand on him, healed him. I want you to think of that verse that we, I love to share, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. Although God didn't cause the storm, although he didn't make them get marooned, think about it. Had Paul never been in the storm, had he never been run aground, had he ever, never been marooned on Malta, had the snake never bit him, uh, he never would have had the opportunity to show God to this man. 
I know you don't understand why you have to go through what you are going through today. But one day, God's going to use that experience as hard as it was, and he's going to use it to touch someone else. And you want to hear something really crazy? The same hand that the snake bit, Paul is now laying on this man and healing him with the power of God. I want you to think about that. The same hand bit by the snake which should have killed Paul is now being used by Paul to heal someone else. The same hand that had a snake hanging from it now has power flowing from it. Verse 7 says, it was three days since the snake bite to, to when this man was healed. What a coincidence. It took three days for Jesus to heal and save and restore us. I want you to think of this, friends, as we close today and get ready to transition into our communion. In three days, Jesus absorbed the serpent strike so that healing could come through him to us today. It's right there in the very beginning of the Bible. The moment we had a problem, God had a solution. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The same heel that was bit, hallelujah, is the same heel that crushed the serpent's head. So as the storm starts raging and it continues blowing and, and raging, you do not need a reason when you've got a revelation like that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome God that you are, for all that you are doing and all you will continue to do in the lives of your people. Lord, as we enter into the communion service, Lord, I pray that we would sacredly take part of these emblems and we will be blessed as a result. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.